Thanks, Bill. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, supply chains, evolving supply chains. Uh, I think it was like 1990, uh, I gave a talk to the Ontario Wheat Board. It was a marketing talk. Uh, they wanted to know how to get a higher price for their wheat. And I said, well, you have to differentiate. I said, uh, t tell me what's special about Ontario wheat. And they said, nothing. <laughs> I, I said, well, surely the wind comes across from the east or the west. I don't care where it comes from. It must come from somewhere. And they said, you don't understand. All wheat is the same. Well, if you're trying to get an extra margin out of your wheat, that's not the way to go. <laughs> this is why these are called commodities is because of the mental set that it's all the same. And, and this was the mental set for a long time. And uh, in a way, I'm here to tell you that that's changing. Uh, one reason it's changing is because of increasing traceability. Uh, that's enabled by technology. Uh, so traceability clearly is uh, important in, uh, when there's an E. coli outbreak. People are potentially dying. You want to know where that lettuce or where those tomatoes came from. Uh, traceability can help you figure out that farm and whatever. Uh, one of the rises uh, of uh, non-commodity is GMOs, where for the first time, I can say literally for the first time, but in the big grand scheme of things, for the first time, people got very fussy about what kind of grain they were getting. Is it GMO? Is it not GMO? The Europeans taking the charge. And so agriculture traders had to start separating, separating the two. Once you start separating, when you get the hang of separating, you can keep doing it. Um, consumers have played a role. Uh, consumers, some consumers want organic. Uh, how do we know this stuff actually is organic? Did it come from, so now you have to ins start inspecting farms. People want sustainability. People want worker welfare. But you, in order to, you, you obviously, you just look at the grain. You can't tell that. So you have to go back and start inspecting. So suddenly, there's a move to understanding where this crop has actually come from. And retailers now go and inspect farms. Or they have agents inspecting farms. Once you start caring where the stuff comes from, then you actually start talking to farmers, which is a miracle. Um, but that leads to retailers, for example, manufacturers, actually buying from specific farmers. Once you start inspecting, you start realizing who's doing well, who's not doing well. So Tesco, for 25 years, whatever it was, uh, lived by essentially buying from the cheapest. I mean, I've been maligning them slightly, but buying from the cheapest. But these days, they have specific relationships with farmers. And so the environment has changed. I won't say, I mean, if I, I, I couldn't give you a percentage of what is still traded as commodity and what is not traded as commodity, but the trend is in that direction. Um, Tesco is not the only one having direct relationships with farmers. China is having direct relationships with farmers. Uh, China, uh, obviously a big buyer of, uh, shouldn't say commodities, commodities. Um, so they're trying to do long-term deals with farmers, with co-ops. They're trying to buy land uh, in South America and uh, Africa. So instead of relying on just buying from the pool, I mean, even if, even if Ontario wheat was any different, was different from somebody else's, when it gets transported, it sort of gets all put in the same container as everybody else's, and it all gets lost. Uh, thinking of China and thinking of uh, buying uh, grain, uh, another development in supply chains, uh, which has been with us for a long time, is food security, uh, self-sufficiency. Um, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, when the whole world seemed to be going to, we're all in this together kind of thing, uh, agriculture was too, uh, and then we had, then we had the kind of food crisis of 2008. That sort of period when prices shot up. Countries suddenly started to realize that food security was a non-trivial issue. That's something they should really be thinking about, or thinking again that it was 
an important topic. Um, if you're Japan these days, you import 60% of your food. That to me seems like too much. I don't know about, we could go around the room, but you're an island. I mean, if you can tell I'm English, I'm British. Um, as a youngster, I heard about the massive losses that the British were making in their nationalized shipbuilding industry. Um, after the Second World War, uh, Britain decided that it was in their strategic interest to be able to build its own ships. I won't dwell. But, you know, if you're Japan and you're importing 60% of your food, this seems, does seem like a security issue. But trade is going up. International trade is going up. Um, again, going back to China with its constraints of land and water, it makes sense to be importing large amounts of food. Uh, currently, it's sort of soybeans, but Meat certainly make a lot of sense, uh, meat from South America. Those trade lines are quite long, and you might start to get a little worried about it. But the question of whether supply chain, when you think about the future, is the supply, are the supply chains going to be increasing intercontinentally or not? And a lot of it depends on the political climate, but presumably the economic solution is that yes. The other um, issue in supply chains uh, I'd like to talk about is a problem I talk, describe as correlated risk. Uh, farming has always been a kind of risky business. Uh, the factory's outside is the way I like to think about it. You know, you've got weather, you've got pests. But these are diversifi diversifiable risks across the country, if the country's big enough, across the world, certainly. You're, you know, your good weather and I'm having bad weather, sort of thing. Um, but those are, uh, but now there are uh, what I call demand risks. I mean, one demand risk is China suddenly stops importing uh, when they have a huge proportion of the traded commodities. Um, but there are other examples. Uh, my, the one that always sticks in my mind is Dr. Akin saying we shouldn't be eating bread or carbohydrates. And in my mind, like everybody stops eating bread the next day. You know, this is a real problem. Or somebody says that you can now eat eggs, you know. So suddenly everyone's rushing out and it's this communication thing that's making everybody act in the same way. I mean, I think there are bigger issues in the world of this coordinated behavior than just agribusiness. But it's something uh, that's affecting agribusiness. So my message is that maybe uh, 30 years seems like a long time to you. Um, but in 30 years, the supply chains have evolved a lot to match consumer tastes, uh, to match the capabilities of technology they'll be developing further. Um, if, if you want my uh, opinion on it, I mean, I think the productivity of agribusiness is such that I don't really think we as a globe need to worry about starving. But I think the question is, particularly with the sort of demand risk and so on and so forth, is whether the volatility in prices will increase. Thank you.